Oh, it's good? Okay. So, thank you very much for this kind introduction. My name is Marcin Vanek. I'm from New York University, Abu Dhabi, and I'll speak today about high in social networks. This will be definitely more of a breath-like tutorial, not a depth-like tutorial. So, even if you don't have much experience in social network analysis and graph theory, so I hope you will, you will break something from this presentation. First, I will give a brief uh, introduction of what is the what is the idea behind this line of research that we are, we are uh, doing in NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, in the recent years, the increased reliance on the internet makes us more and more uh, exposed to analyzing our digital traces by by artificial intelligence, by machine learning algorithms, by social network analysis measures. And the increasing digitalization makes it possible to do at an unprecedented scale. Uh, many feel that this analysis done by corporations and governments alike could lead in the future to Orwellian society, to a world where AI plays the role of powerful and, and, and all-knowing big brother. Uh, and at the same time, current literature on, on privacy preservation assumes that the role of protecting our privacy lies in the, in, the, in the hands of a central authority. You have one central authority that is supposed to protect the, the privacy of the entire society. However, numerous scandal, numerous privacy scandal in the recent years show that it might not always work very well. So in this line of research, we try to change the situation. A very general setting that we'll move today within is such that we have a social network, so a, a network representing people, and we have a specific node, a specific person in this social network. We call this person the evader. And outside this network, we have a certain entity called the seeker who will try to analyze this network to get some information, some private information about the evader. So the seeker might have different questions about, about the evader. For example, the seeker might wonder, how important is the evader in the social network? Or the seeker might wonder, does the evader have any undisclosed relationships between other, mem with other members of this network? Or the seeker might wonder, what is the evader's political orientation? And if you think about this question, the evader might not want to reveal some of these information to the seeker or to the outside world in general. So what can the evader do? As I said, uh, literature existing so far usually treats the evader as a purely passive entity. It assumes that maybe there exists some central authority that tries to protect the privacy of the evader. However, the seeker is the strategic player. The seeker uses different types of tools and methods to analyze this network to get some additional information about the evader, while the evader remains purely passive. And in this line of research, what we try to do is what we, we try to empower the evader. We try to model the evader as a strategic entity who also tries to use some methods, some techniques, some algorithms to protect their own privacy. So in today's talk, I'll try to focus on five different topics, actually. In each of these topics, I will first present a different uh, a tool, a specific uh, method of analyzing, of getting information from a social network. Then I will show how it's possible to how it's possible to to defend to protect from this type of tools. Uh, so I will focus on centrality measures, who who which measure importance of a notice in a social network, on community detection algorithms, which allow to to uh, infer group membership in a social network, on link prediction algorithms that allow to find undisclosed relationships in a social network, on source detection algorithms that can detect the source of a, of a diffusion process, and finally on stance detection algorithms that can detect the opinion of people in social networks. Okay, before we move on, a quick, a quick like theoretical uh, background. Uh, when, I, when I talk about social network, I will generally mean an undirected graph. So a graph between, with a set of nodes connected by some edges. 
And because I'm talking about undirected graph, you can think about these edges as a, as a uh, symmetric relationships. So these are lines and not arrows. Uh, a group of nodes connect, connected to a given node, I will call it its neighbors. A number of neighbors of a given node is called a degree. And finally, I will measure a distance in, in this social network as a number of the number of edges on the shortest path between between two nodes. So in this very simple network, the distance between V and W is two, because I can get from V to W in just two hops by going over two edges. OK, so the first part of this talk will be about uh, centrality measures. This will be the longest, uh, the longest talk because we published the most research on it. So maybe I'll pres I will use this opportunity to also introduce some kind of different types of network structures, such, such as multi-layer networks and uh, temporal networks. OK, but first of all, what is a centrality measure? A centrality measure is an algorithm that allows you to, to evaluate the relative importance of nodes in the network. So now I'll introduce like very basic centrality measures. The very simplest centrality measure is a degree centrality. So degree centrality, the intuition behind it is that it says that the most important node is the network is the one who has the greatest number of friends. So degree centrality is just measured as the number of friends, as the degree of a node. Second, we have a close, closeness centrality. Closeness centrality implies that the most important node in the network is the one who is close to everyone else. So we take the sum of distances between a given node and all other nodes in the network, and we take it reciprocal. So here, for example, you can see that node E in this simple example network has greater, greater centrality, greater closeness centrality than node A, right? Because it's close, closer to the, to the center of this network. Betweenness centrality, on the other hand, says that the most important node in the network is the one who controls the flow of information in the network. So in order to compute betweenness centrality, we take a look at all pairs of other nodes in the network. We take a look at the shortest paths between those pairs of nodes, and we check what nodes lie on these shortest paths. So for example, in this network, the betweenness centrality of node E is 12, because any shortest path between the four nodes above E and the three nodes below E has to, has to run through E. Right? So it controls the flow of information from the upper component of the network to the lower component of the network. At the same time, if we take a look at the between the centrality of node G, for example, it's zero. Why? Because all neighbors of G are connected to, it, to themselves. So no shortest paths lie through G. Uh, and finally, very popular centrality measure is eigenvector centrality, which it has very simple intuition, but uh, a bit complicated formula. So the intuition is that I am important in the network if my neighbors are important. However, if you would like to compute the eigenvector centrality, this is the entry in the eigenvector corresponding to the greatest eigenvalue of adjacency metrics of this network. So it's not very easy to compute, but it's very popular, so I decided to, to present it here. More often than not, we will not be interested in just the value of a node centrality, but rather of its ranking. So we'll not be interested whether the centrality of a given node is four, five, or six, but we'll be, we'll be interested in what place in the ranking this node is positions. So for example, if I am the first node in the centrality ranking, if I seem as the most important node is in the network, I might feel exposed, right? I might feel, I might feel endangered because if someone will try to attack this network and target most important nodes, they are likely to target me. Okay. So he, this is the general idea behind, behind this, this particular line of research, behind hiding in social network. So what would happen if I am one of the key players in a social network, but I don't want to be perceived like this? For example, you can think about the situation of opposition bloggers in authoritarian regimes, right? So for example, I'm important as part of my social network, but I don't want to seem important. <coughs> On the other hand, centrality measures are also often used to, to analyze terrorist and criminal organizations. So we might also want to investigate this topic in order to see how, how crime lords and how terrorists, how criminals might want to hide in order to then be able to, to identify them. So we'll attempt to hide from centrality measures by rewiring the network. So by adding and removing edges to and from the network. So the goal is to 
hide our importance from degree, closeness, and betweenness centrality. However, if this would be the entire problem, it would be fairly simple to solve, right? I can just disconnect myself from the network completely, and then I will seem completely unimportant. However, in most cases, I am still interested in participating in the activities of these networks, right? So I still want to be, so I still want to be connected to this network. So in order to, to model this, we need to have some counterbalance to the, to the centrality. So what we decided to use as the counterbalance is the influence. So we measure the influence using two models, independent cascade and linear threshold. I'll present them in a moment. So I not only want to hide my importance from centrality measures, but I also want to maintain influential in the social network. OK. So again, we can measure inf our influence or a node's influence in a social network using influence models. The first model is independent cascade. And these models are typically described in a way of some activation process spreading through the network. So at the beginning of the process, only the source node, so the node that we want to measure the importance of, is activated. I will mark this as red. And every edge in the network is marked with a probability of activation. So with a probability that this edge will pass activation from one end of the edge to another. In most cases, we assume that this, this probability of activation is the same over the entire network. Every newly activated node has one single chance to activate each of his neighbors. So let's see how this process will go in this network. So at the beginning, again, only the source node, so V star, is activated. And it has a chance to activate each of his neighbors, each of his two neighbors. Let's say that he managed to, to flip a coin for the left neighbor. Now this, this left neighbor, who is, who is newly activated node, has one chance to activate each of his neighbors. And let's say that he managed to activate both of them. And then now these newly activated nodes have chance to activate their neighbors. But let's say that they all failed. So now the process stops, right? There are no newly activated nodes. So, uh, so we can see that this, this particular iteration, this particular uh, version of this process, managed to activate four different nodes. So what is the influence, how we measure the influence of the source node? We express it as the expected number of activated nodes. In particular, when we want to compute it in practice, we usually run Monte Carlo process, in which we run this, this process many, many times, and we check how many, how many nodes, on average, get activated as a result of this process. OK, so this was independent cascade model. Linear threshold is fairly, fairly similar. It is also expressed in the matter of uh, node activation. However, in this process, at the beginning of the process, every node is getting assigned a random threshold. So this threshold is the percentage of this node's neighbors who has to be activated in order for this node to become activated. So the, the idea behind this model comes from the research on peer pressure and, uh, and how, how different ideas spread in a society. So for example, when we think about smoking cigarettes, if the, the theory is that every person has such inner threshold that if enough of my friends start to smoke cigarettes, I will also start to smoke cigarettes. This threshold might differ between, between different people. So that's why here we, we chose it randomly at the beginning of the process. However, it kind of, it kind of uh, determines how this, this, this activation process will spread through the network. So let's see how it goes. At the beginning, again, only the source node is activated in red. But you can see that the neighbor on the left needs to only have one of his three neighbors to be activated, to be active in order to become activated. So we can see that it now became activated. Now the node on the right needs only two of his neighbors to be active in order to become activated. So it also becomes activated. And now we can, but however, now we see that the nodes on the bottom need three and two of the neighbors to become activated. And there are no, not enough active neighbors. So the process ends now. And again, the influence of the source node is the expected number of activated nodes. However, this time we do not uh, do a coin flips for each edge. We do we randomly select uh, thresholds for each for each node. Okay. So so yet what's the what's the general process that we will consider uh, for centrality measures? We have a centrality measure. We have a, we have a network, and we have a, an evader in this network. And at the beginning, the evader is unhappy because his centrality is very high in this network. 
at the beginning, the evaluator has some level of influence. What we'll do is we'll allow the evader to add or remove some edges to and from the network. In green, we have edges that can be added. In red, we have some edges that can be removed. And we assume that the evader has some budget, has some number of edges that he's allowed, that they are allowed to, to modify in this network to, to improve their situation. So now the evader has to find a way which edges to add and which to remove in order to improve their situation. And you can see that after adding and removing one edge in this in this example network, the, evade, the evader's centrality now drop, dropped, which is what we were hoping for because we, the evader wants to seem less important. However, the influence of this of, over the network remained at about the same level, so it remained very similar. So first of all, we might wonder, okay. How difficult it is to find the optimal answer to this problem. How difficult it is to find the very best possible way of adding or removing edges in order to drop our centrality. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, as it turns out, in most cases, this is an MP-complete MP -complete problem. So we cannot really find an optimal solution for, for a network of reasonable size without performing exponential computations. What is more, when we when we take a look at the problem of rebuilding influence after removing centrality, this is also a very hard problem. These are NP-hard problems. So we cannot find can, can find uh, a reasonable solution in, in reasonable time for these problems in the most cases. Uh, I will now show two examples of how we proved this type of results. So first, let's say that we want to show that uh, Decreasing closeness centrality of a node is an NP-hard NP problem. So what we do is we take a network problem, which we know that is NP-complete from the, from the literature. So in this case, it's finding Hamiltonian cycle problem. Hamiltonian cycle is a, is a cycle, so it's a path that goes over, go, goes over every node in the network exactly once, and it comes back to the beginning. So in a sense, it's a traveling salesman problem in, in, in an unweighted graph. And OK, what we want to show is that if we would have some magical machine that solves our problem, then we would be able to solve this problem, which from the literature we know is NP-complete, very efficiently. So what we will try to do is we will try to construct an instance of our problem corresponding to this particular instance of the finding Hamiltonian cycle problem. So what we do is we take this network, we add, we add the evader as a dangling node in one place of this network. And then uh, we take a look at the node to which the evader is connected. And to each of his neighbors, we connect first one node and then one dangling node. In the formulation of this problem, we assume that after the evader performs the their modifications to the network, so adds and remove edges, the network still remains connected. So it still forms one, one cohesive part. It doesn't fall into multiple, multiple smaller networks. So if we want to decrease the closeness value of a node, what is the best possible structure? What is the, what is the a a network structure consisting of a certain number of nodes in which the evader has the smallest possible value of the centrality measure? As it turns out, it's a path. It's a path on which the evader is one of the ends. So when we try to solve this, this instance of our problem, we allow the algorithm to remove all of the edges. And we assume, OK, let's say we have a magical machine that solves this problem. What we can do? If it's possible, it will find a way to turn this network into a path, into a path with the evader on one of its ends. However, if we would have in our hands such a path, from this path, we can deduce the Hamiltonian cycle in the original graph, right? Because we take this path, we know that the evader has only one neighbor, this particular node. So, and and the other dangling edge, the, the other dangling node, has only one neighbor, and this neighbor is a neighbor with all the all these nodes. So we have that there has to be an edge here. So based on this on this on this path found by our algorithm solving our problem, we can now deduce the, the solution to the NP-complete problem. So we know that our problem is also, is also NP-hard. So it cannot be, so it cannot be solved efficiently. So, 
Similarly, uh, we could prove NP hardness of uh, decreasing the degree ranking. Because as you might remember from the table, like decreasing degree value is the only problem that was in P. However, decreasing degree value, so the, the, ranking, uh, the ranking according to degree centrality is already NP complete. So we'll now prove NP hardness of, of decreasing degree. So now we have a problem of finding k click. So this is the problem of taking a network, taking a graph, and finding whether there exists a click in it. A click is a is a graph in which every single node is connected to every single other node. So let's say that in this small, very simple graph, we want to find a free click. So a click consisting of three nodes. What we can do? is again, we can construct an instance of our problem, the problem of, of height of decreasing the degree ranking of an evader in such a way that we, from the, from the edges from the original network, we allow their addition. This is marked by this green dotted edges here. Then we connect the evader to all of the original nodes and we weigh down the original nodes. So the question is, how can we add edges to this network so that degree of the evader, which in this example is four, will be, will be smaller than the degree of at least k other nodes. So that will be at least where, where k is the constant from the k-click problem. So in this case, we are wondering how we can add edges to this network so that there are at least three other nodes with degrees greater than the evader. We can see that in order to do this, we have to increase the, the degrees of three of the original nodes by at least two. However, we set the budget so that the, the, the algorithm solving our problem can only add as many edges as there are in the click. So we have to increase the, the degree of three nodes, at least three nodes, by at least two. So the only way in which we can do it is by adding a click to the to the in our problem. However, because all of the edges that can be added in our problem belong to the original graph, based again on the solution to our problem, on the hypothetical solution to our problem, we can deduce the solution to the NP complete problem. Thus, our problem is also an is NP hard. It cannot be solved in a reasonable fashion. Uh, we had many such complexity results in, in this line of research. However, these are the only two proofs that I will that will show it to you today. So don't worry. Okay, so since it is very hard to find the optimal solution, how about we find a suboptimal solution? A solution that is not optimal, however, it works reasonably well. So we designed such a heuristic, we call it row, remove one at many. So in order to perform this heuristic, we take a look at the, at the local neighborhood of the, of the node. First, we remove an edge. We remove an edge between the evader and one of their neighbors because in order to decrease your degree, for example, you have to, you have to, you have to get rid of some of your, at least some of your connections. However, the step of removing one of your edges will definitely drop your influence on the network. So in order to rebuild this influence, We'll also add some edges between you and, sorry, between the, the neighbor we just disconnected and some of our other neighbors. And this is the entire heuristic. So using this very simple heuristic that requires only local knowledge about the network, right? I don't have to have information about the complete structure of the network. I don't, want, I don't need to know the entire network. I only need to know my neighbors and the connections between them, which in most social networks is probably reasonable, yeah? Excellent question. So we tested what different variants of this heuristic, and the variant that that was most that was most successful was so that we disconnect ourselves from the neighbor with the greatest degree. So we disconnect ourselves with our friend who has many friends, and we connect this friend with our other friends who has very few friends. So we disconnect from a node with high degree and we connect it to nodes with low degrees. So this is, this is the, the, the variant that proved to be most successful. This is it. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let's see what happens if some really bad guys would use this heuristic in, in an actual social network. 
So this is a very well-known network. This is a network of terrorists from 9-11 attacks, which was composed by Krebs in 2001. And the note in the middle is Mohammed Atta. He was one of the ringleaders behind the attacks. And this work was kind of a cornerstone of centrality measures because in this network, as it turns out, when you compute degree, closeness, and betweenness ranking, Atta proves to be first, very first in all three rankings. So this is supposed to show the power of centrality measures, that if you take an actual terrorist network, and if you take an actual ringleader, an actual leader of this network, he actually turns out to be the first in all three centrality rankings. And he has some, some, some levels of influence over this network. So let's see what happens if Atta would use Rome. So we run Rome heuristic once. So we remove one of the Atta's edges and we connect the, the neighbor that we removed the connection from with to, to our, two of our other nodes. And let's do it one more time. Again, we disconnect, disconnect Atta with one of the, his, edges, his neighbors and we connect this neighbor to two other nodes. And we can see that after modifying just six edges in this network, so after removing two and adding four edges to this network, Atta is now fifth, fourth, and 11th in the free centrality rankings. However, he remained on about the same level of influence. According to independent cascade, he lost some of the influence over this network. However, according to linear threshold, he even gained some of the influence. So this shows that our heuristic is kind of at least a little bit successful, at least on this, on this particular example. OK, a question that we now might to ask is, fine, so we know how to modify an existing network, but could would we be able to construct an, a new one, a new network from scratch that already has good qualities from the very beginning? So let's assume that we have a group of leaders and we have a group of followers. And what we want to do is to connect them into a network so that there are no leaders in the top centrality ranking. So the centrality ranking of the, of, of the leaders is, is low. The leaders are protected from, an, from a strategic attack on this network. However, the leaders can still effectively communicate with the rest of the network. So uh, technically, in, the, in our research, we, we stated this so that the leaders still have the, the top influence in the network. So they are still very influential, but at the same time, they are protected from the, from the, from the centrality analysis by a potential seeker. OK, so we came up with such a structure. So the, the construction of the structure goes like this. We take uh, leaders and we connect them into a clique. So again, we connect each leader with all other leaders. Then for each leader, we assign a group of captains. So these captains are the only nodes that the leaders will communicate with in this network. We connect the captains into full k graph. So it means that a captain, which belongs to a particular group, knows all other captains outside of his group, but he knows no captains from his own group. This is a full k graph. And then we take the remaining nodes in the, that we want to be a part of this network, and we connect them to the captains. So we, in particular, we connect each of the, of the normal nodes to one captain from each group. And as it turns out, it can be proven that in this, in this particular network structure, uh, leaders, uh, all every single captain have greater degree, closeness, and betweenness centrality than all of the single leaders. However, if you take a look at the, at the influence values computed using simulations, they are still the most influential. It might be interesting to say how we came up with this structure. Uh, after, after we published this work, Someone, co someone commented that there are similar structures in, in IRA and in IRA struct in IRA network structures in Ireland, and it would be nice to say that this was our inspiration, but it was not. So actually, when we tried to look for structures with this for this type of structure to build such a network in which the leaders will be protected but will be still influential, what we do is we try to generate many, many, many random small networks, and for each of them we check where they have this property. And then some of them had, most of them did not, of course. But then we looked at some of, of at this small subset of networks that had this property, and we tried to notice patterns between them. And in most of them, there was a leader, which was connected to a small set of captains, and the rest of the network was only connected to this set of captains. So then we tried to formalize it into this type of structure, which is much more ordered. 
And then we were, because of this level of formalism of the structure, we were able to prove some, some, some hard theoretical results. Uh, okay, so this was one expansion of our work. Uh, now, another question that we might ask in this space is, okay, so it seems that while fi finding an optimal way to hide from centrality measure is difficult, it is reasonably easy to find some way, to hide, to hide from centrality measures in, in, in some way. So, is it just a matter of a poor performance of these existing centrality measures? Would it be possible to find a centrality measure that is very good, that is very, very hard to hide from, uh, that is resilient to strategic manipulation? So in order to quantify the levels of manipulability of a certain centrality measure, we would need to have a measure of such manipulability. And this is something that we tried to, to come up with in this work. This was led by Tomek Gvons from the University of Warsaw. Uh, okay, some of my animation doesn't work. So we defined five axioms of such measure of manipulability. So this is an axiomatic approach. First axiom is, okay, the best centrality measure, the, the least manipulable, manipulable centrality measure is when the evader rankings never drop. So whatever the evader will do, whatever edges he will add or remove, his ranking will not change. On the other hand, the worst possible case is when the evaders, when every single action of the evader drops the evader's centrality ranking. So this would be the, the worst possible centrality measure. Uh, such uh, a measure of manipulability should not favor one centrality graph or node of the, over another, right? So if we if we if we would rename the parts of this network, the results should stay the same. Uh, actions that never uh, the fourth axiom is that actions that never drop the evaders ranking doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so if we remove it from the from the set of possible actions to the evader, the manipulability of this centrality measure should not change. And finally. A good centrality measure, a resilient centrality measure, is a centrality measure that requires many actions to drop centrality ranking. So after analyzing this set of axioms, we came to the conclusion that the only, the only measure that satisfies all five of the axioms is one over the minimal number of actions required to decrease evaders ranking. So for all the possible formulas of the of the of the measure of manipulability, this is the only one that, that satisfies all those five axioms, which seem kind of reasonable. I'm sorry, some of my some of my animations seem broke. It should be appearing like one at a time, but okay. Uh, the next way in which we try to expand this work is the Stackelberg game. So so far, we assumed that while the while the evader knows about the existence of seeker and he tries to hide from the seeker, the seeker doesn't really know that the evader exists, right? The seeker just uses centrality measures and then just accepts the results as, as they are. Now, what we're trying to do is we try to model a game between the seeker and the evader in which they both know about each other's existence. And we'll try to model it as a Stuckelberg game. A Stuckelberg game is a game in which one player moves first. In this case, the seeker will move first by selecting a centrality measure to analyze the network. And then the evader observes the choice of C and selects one of the hiding heuristic. Uh, moreover, we, when we measure the utility of the evader from this game, we assume that it has two components, that the evader can gain utility from lowering their centrality and from increasing or maintaining their influence. Uh, so when we take a look at the utility coming from the centrality ranking, we have some, we have a particular ranking, particular value in this example 20, which we assume that, okay, this is a satisfying, this is a satisfying value for the evader. Uh, and if, if the evader is very close, very close to the top of the ranking. So if the position of the divider is one, the utility is zero, 
but when it when it's uh, much lower than this than this uh, than this particular position they gain kind of decreasing decreasing uh, decreasing utility from it we also assume that the evader gets some utility from the influence from the change of influence in this game so um, we assume that if the on the x axis we have the evaders the evaders influence change if the if it's zero, so if the influence of the evader remains the same, the utility is also zero. So they are completely satisfied with staying at the same influence level. Uh, they are happy with sacrificing some of their some of their uh, influence to to be more safe. So in when we go to negative values of influence, it kind of stays about uh, constant for some time and then slowly drops. And if their uh, influence increases, they are also happy with getting more influence when you have. And we can have different different types of the evader. So for so what we do is we take linear combination of these two utilities uh, using the weight of of phi. So for evaders with greater phi, they are more interested in saying staying safe. They are more interested in lowering their centrality ranking. And for smaller values of phi, they are more. These are the evaders who are more interested in increasing their influence and less interested in their centrality ranking. Moreover, we assume that this is a zero-sum game. So the utility of the seeker is the negative utility of the evader. So this, the, in, in, in the essence, the evader wants to hide and remain influential, and the seeker wants the opposite. So let's see some results. Uh, so first, these are the equilibria of the Stuckerberg game. So on, in the upper row, we can see the mixed strategy of the seeker consisting of different centrality measures. So at the beginning, in this particular type of network, which is barabasi albert network, uh, the seeker selects one of the centrality measures. In this case, we can see that it's mostly degree. And the evader, different, the evader of different types, here we can see types uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. Again, greater values of 5 means that the seeker is the, the evader is more interested in in staying hidden the lower values of of 5, five uh, signifies that the evader is more interested in staying influential and the strategy of the evader is mixed strategy over different different types of roam heuristic the number in the row means how many add edges we add after each removal Right? So Rome 1 means that we remove one edge, add one edge to the network. Whereas Rome 4 means that we remove one edge and we add four different edges to the network. So here it's somewhat, somewhat probably uh, intuitive that if I am more interested in my own influence rather than my own centrality, so if I have lower phi, I am more interested in adding more edges to the network, right? Because even if I won't be as safe as I could, I will remain more influential. So let's see how it looks in different types of networks. Uh, we can see that uh, for the evader, the structure of their, their, their strategies remains more or less the same. So if I am more interested in being hidden, I am using I am adding less edges to the network. I'm using Chrome with lower value. If I want to remain influential, I add, I add more <laughs> edges to the network. However, from the side of the seeker, the composition of their strategy changes significantly. So which strategy is, which centrality is the best for the seeker highly depends on the, on the network structure and the consideration. And we might also want to take a look at the expected utility of the evader. Here we can see that if I have greater fine, so if I am more interested in staying hidden, I can actually, in most cases, achieve greater expected utility. So if, in a way, if I am, want to be stay hidden in the network, as opposed to staying more influential, I can be happier in the stack of game. OK, uh, now to end the section about centrality measures, I will introduce two, two alternative uh, network structures. So far, we only consider completely normal, uh, normal simple networks. So we have edges uh, and nodes of only one type. However, in many cases, in, in a network, you might have edges of different types, right? Let's let's take an example of a, of a communication network. When I communicate with my friends, when I communicate with the people I know, I might use different means of communication, right? 
Moreover, for communicating with a single person, I could use multiple different ways of communication. So this is the type of structure that we see here. We have edges of different colors. Each color represents a different mean of communication. Uh, and we might take a, a different look at the structure. We could divide the nodes into layers based on what communication tools they use. So we can see that in, in layer dedicated to Facebook, we only have nodes who use Facebook communication measure, and we only have blue edges. Similarly for email, it's for WhatsApp. Uh, very often, when we consider, consider multi-layer network, we also add edges between copies of the same of the same node, right? Because we can see that, for example, B uses both Facebook and WhatsApp. So B appears in two different layers of this network. So in order to, to show, to sign that this B is the same node, we connect their copies, copies of B in, with, with an edge. Uh, OK, so how do we compute centrality in such a, such a multi-layer network? In general, in literature, there are two different approaches. And we call it, in our work, we call it local and global approaches. So the local approach is very simple. We take a multi-layer network, and we simply cut it into separate layers. We apply the same centrality measure to each layer separately. And for each layer, we get a different ranking of the nodes. And then we use some kind of aggregation measure, aggregation way to, to get to turn them into a simple into a single ranking. And this method is very simple because we don't really have to come up with any, any sophisticated new tools. We just use existing tools, cut the network, apply the tools, and then aggregate the results. However, it's maybe not very satisfying to just use local centrality measures in multi-layer networks. So let's take a look at global centrality measures, which treat the entire multi-layer network as a whole. However, now we need to uh, slightly adjust the definitions of the, of the centralities. So first of all, when we take a look at degree centrality, we now ask the questions, OK, what are the nodes in which I'm connected with in at least one layer? Of course, we could, we could define it in a different way. But the definition that we use, and I think which is more, most popular, is that I take a look at all the nodes. And if I connect it with at least one copy of this node, it counts as one for the case for the for the purpose of degree centrality. For example, here we can see that A is connected with B in two different layers. However, we only count one such one such occurrence. Okay, in closeness centrality, the formula remains the same, but we assume that the shortest paths may run between occurrences in different layers. So, for example, in this particular network, the shortest path from D to I runs from the occurrence of D in layer A to the occurrence of D the, to the occurrence of I in, in layer beta, from alpha to beta. Because we can see that, for example, we might also get to from D to I only in layer beta, but it would take it would take one, two, three, four, five steps. And from alpha to to from uh, D to I in alpha, it would also take one, two, three, four, five steps. But this interlayer root takes only one, two, three, four steps. So we just allow the, the paths to run over multiple layers. This is the only change to, to closeness. And for betweenness, what we do is again we take a look at all the shortest paths between different occurrences of nodes. However, now we allow the the, the nodes to take to get yes. Each layer you are not passing uh, all the uh, all the nodes. Uh, you have different layer. Yes. So in uh, in separate layer you have different set of nodes. Yes, that's true. Because because as as we mentioned before, for example, one of my friends might not use email at all, might not, or might not have Facebook account at all, right? So yeah, so here for example, C does not appear in layer A. So the so the nodes might not appear in all of the layers. That's true. Yeah, good point. So for between us again, we look at the at the shortest paths between nodes, but when a node appears multiple times. In a, in a path, such as in here, G appears twice in the shortest path. It gets, in a way, two points from this path. So it controls this path more than, than other nodes. So again, the variation of the problem that we consider in this particular work 
is such that we have an evader and we have a multi-layer network in which, which this evader is part of. And the problem is that we pose is that, okay, the evader wants to remain connected with a set of nodes using some kind, some mean of communication, right? So in this case, uh, the evader, so node A, wants to remain connected with nodes uh, which with nodes that are that are black. So what the evader has to do is to choose one at least one layer for each node to remain connected with through in in this particular layer. So we can see that the, in a, in this example, the solution is that the evader choose to connect remain connected with B, E, and D over Facebook and from C and F over email. And the choice of layer for each node is the, is the problem that the evader wants to solve. Uh, I will not show you the proofs, but again, this problem for all these free centrality measures that we discussed is NP complete. So it's impossible, it's basically impossible to find the, the very best solution. However, a heuristic that seems very, very effective in practice in the network that we tested is that we connect, we try to connect with a densely connected group of friends in each layer. So if my if all of my friends from a particular social group who also know each other you use Facebook, I should connect through Facebook with them. And if another group of my closely connected friends connect using email with each other, I should connect also with them using email. And using this type of heuristic, I can remain relatively, relatively hidden. Okay, so these were uh, multi-layer networks, now temporal networks. Temporal networks are slightly different. In temporal network, a given edge exists not for all the time, but we have some 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 particular moment in which a given edge exists. In this example, for example, uh, an edge between nodes v1 and v2 exists only in moment one. So you can think about the first day of the month, for example, or the first day of the week. Uh, another way to think about it is that these these two nodes meet in person on a particular day of the week, right? So this edge is not existing throughout the, the entire week, but only on a specific day. And to, to think about this network, a useful, useful idea is a time-respecting path. So a time-respecting path is a path in which all contacts occur chronologically. So for example, a path from V1 to V3 to V4 is Time respecting, right? Because meeting between V1 and V3 comes before the meeting between V3 and V4, right? V1 and V3 meet on Wednesday, and V3 and V4 meet on Friday. However, the path V4, V4, V3, V1 is not time respecting, right? Because meeting before between V4 and V3 comes after the meeting between V3 and V1. Another concept that is useful here is that instead of distance, because the distance that we discussed so far, so the distance measured in the edges, means relatively little to us now, right? Because all of these edges happen in different moments in time. So now we can think about latency. So latency, latency can be intuitively thought about this way. If I would want, if at a particular moment in time, I want to pass a message to a particular node in this network, how long it will take this message to reach this particular node over the, uh, if the message can only travel through the edges of this network, right? So if I have a piece of paper that I want to pass to someone and this, all of these edges represent physical meetings between people, how can this piece of paper reach from one node to another? Broken animation, sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is this is the plot of latency from between from V1 to V4. So we might take a look. So why at the moment of time zero, the latency from V1 to V4 is four? Well, because if it's not, if now at the moment, it's moment of time zero, in order for the message to reach from V1 to V4, it can, it first <coughs> have to be passed from V1 to V2 in moment one, and then it has to be passed from V2 to V4 in moment four. So it will reach the, the recipient at the moment four. But for example, if at the moment, at the moment five, I want to pass a message from V1 to V4, how long do I have to take? How, how long do I have to wait? Well, I have to wait only, only one unit of time, right? Because if it's the moment five, then I know that I will meet V4 directly at moment six. 
So I only have to wait one unit of time. So again, instead of the physical distance between, between nodes in network, we are interested in the temporal distance between them. Uh, okay, so again, also in this case, finding the optimal way to hide. So the optimal way to lower my, my, my centralities is NP complete. Oh, so the difference in centralities is pretty much that instead of the normal distance, we use the temporal distance. Uh, again, finding the optimal way to hide is NP complete. Instead, we tested a number of different heuristic solutions, uh, consisting of adding some edges and removing some edges. The smaller plots, uh, OK, so in each plot, we have on the x-axis the influence change. So closer to the right-hand side, I, am more, I become more influential. And closer to the top, I'm becoming more hidden, because on the y-axis, we have ranking change. So uh, each of the smaller plots, is a particular network, and the big plot is is one uh, is the aggregated results over all the nodes over all the networks. Uh, each dot is a particular node using a particular heuristic. So, uh, and each color is a different centrality measure. So the general the general trends that we can see in this plot is that the removal heuristics, so the heuristic that are kind of empty points. Uh, Again, the removal makes me more hidden because for removal, I'm losing a little bit of influence. I'm close to the left-hand side of the plot, but I'm also up the plot. So I'm being more, being more hidden. While the addition of new contacts, the, the addition of new meetings between nodes in this network makes me more influential, but at the same time, less hidden. So I'm closer to the right-hand side of the plot, but I'm also lower. So we can see that the, the general trend remains the same in this, in this very different network structure. Uh, another thing that we tested in this setting is, OK, if a particular node is very successful in hiding, why are they successful? So we measured different characteristics of the nodes. We performed last regression analysis to find what, what characteristics are connected with being successful in hiding. And one one characteristic that was very strongly positively correlated with ability with the ability to hide was the average intercontact time, which suggests that if I want to hide in a temporal network, I should kind of spread my meetings over time. I should not meet with all my friends at one point in time. I should move uh, meet with them separately over time. Okay, uh, so this is the end of the. Centrality part, as I said, this was the longest part, so don't worry, the other, all of the other parts are based on just a single work. Okay, so the second kind of tool that I want to talk about are uh, community detection algorithms. So in the network literature, a community in general is just a group of closely cooperating individuals. A community detection is an algorithm that takes a network structure and it divides its set of nodes into communities. Here we can see that some algorithm divided this particular network into three different communities. And this division of a set of nodes into communities is called community structure. So this is a community structure consisting of three communities. Um, how do we say whether a particular community structure is good or not? So intuitively, we would like to have more edges within the communities than between the communities, right? Because if a set of edges, if a community is a closely cooperating group of nodes, we probably would expect it to be very dense, right? However, if we would only calculate the, the edges bet between the communities and within the communities, then the very best possible structure would be a structure characteristic of just a single community, right? The entire network, which is a community structure, but maybe we don't always want to get this particular community structure. So a popular measure of community structure quality is modularity. Modularity, uh, modularity takes into consideration the number of edges between the nodes of Z of C. So this, these are the this is the number of edges within the community. Uh, however, uh, the it also punishes very big very big communities because it uh, subtracts the sum of the degrees of the nodes in a community. And uh, so this is intuitively how the modularity works. If we take a look at this community structure, which seems kind of reasonable, right? All of these communities are connected inside and like mostly disconnected outside. The value of modularity for this particular community structure is 0.42, about 0.43. Uh, 
And if we take a look at a different community structure, this one seems much less reasonable, right? Because for example, in community C3, not even all the nodes are connected with each other. They don't really know each other. So why would they be in the, in the same community? This seemingly much less reasonable community structure is only 0 0.08. So this is the intuition behind the modularity. So how do, how can community diction algorithms work? I will describe two in a little bit more detail and give an intuition because before behind another five. Okay, so first algorithm is betweenness, uh, which is also called Girvan Newman from the from the names of people who, who designed it. The idea is that we that we iteratively remove edges from the network, edges that contain that lie on many shortest paths in this network. Because the idea is that many shortest paths will run between the communities and not within the communities. So at the beginning, we have one, one possible community structure, which is just of single community. Then we remove an edge. And now we can see that the, the network fell apart into two separate, separate, uh, separate components. So we say, OK, each component is now separate community. And we continue removing edges. Nothing happens. Now network fall apart again. So we say, OK, another community structure, another community structure, remove, remove. So we came up with six. So, yeah. Are we considering the communities with this So uh, the network that we consider is this initial con connected network, right? It's just at the moment when we are computing this. Mm -hmm. It would be it in f oh here. I may have uh, like different. Oh, you, if you would be a part of different communities. So we did not consider this, although there is literature on like, it's called overlapping community yeah. structures. Yes, yes, yes. So there is a, there is a literature on this. Uh, we did not consider it. So here we only consider like uh, not non-overlapping communities. So we assume that each node is a part of only one community. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we came up with, with several different community structures. And which of them do we, do we pick? Well, we pick the one with the greatest modularity because we, we think that modularity is a good good measure of quality. Uh, greedy algorithm is a bit interesting because it goes in the exact opposite opposite direction. So at the beginning, we have community structure characteristic of each node in its own very small separate <laughs> community. And then we see, we consider merging different communities. And we pick the one that uh, from which merge will get the greatest gain in modularity. So it's a greedy algorithm. So first we select two to connect, then another two to connect, 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 connect. So it works in exact opposite way to, to between us. And again, we select one with, 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 with good modularity. And there are many different other commit detection algorithms. Walk trap based on random walks. Eigenvector computes eigenvectors and splits the nodes based on the signs in the eigenvector. Louvain do some local local optimizations, InfoMap does probability flows, SpinGlass. SpinGlass is interesting because it has physical interpretation. It treats nodes as atoms in magnets and checks the spins of them. But so there are many different computation algorithms. Uh, now, what would happen if I am part of the group of nodes that do not want to be, to, that do not want to be exposed as a closely cooperating group of nodes? For example, I'm a part of some uh, minority uh, persecuted based on religious or ethnic background. Uh, Community action algorithms were also used in the literature to perform different tasks. For example, there was a work about predicting sexual orientation of people based on the community that they belong to using community action algorithms. So some groups might want to hide the fact that they are a community. So again, we have a network, we have a group of nodes. And at the beginning, this group of nodes is very unhappy because they are exposed as a separate community. So if we want to add and remove some edges from the network so that in this new network, they are now not exposed as a, as a separate group. So we, we see that in this new network, they are now in three different communities. Um, okay. So uh, what we would like to do is we would like to, again, measure how well we are, we are hidden. Because for centrality, we kind of had an obvious measure. We had a centrality ranking here. Maybe we are not so sure whether we are well hidden or not. 
So we have two different measures measuring two different concepts of hiding. So the first measure, the first way of hiding is spreading over multiple communities. So if I'm not part of the same community, but I'm part that but my group is part of several communities in the result of the community action algorithm, I'm more my, I'm more happy. And the other way of hiding is joining, hiding in the crowd, right? So if I'm not exposed as a separate community, but I'm exposed as a small, small part of a very great big community, maybe I am more well hidden, right? Maybe we'll no, no one will notice that this particular small group of people is is collaborating with each other. And we combine these two these two ideas of a measure into a simple into a simple measure. So here we can see that in in case when where I am exposed as a simple as a single community the value of this measure is zero here where i'm not only each of my members is a separate community but this community is covered the entire network the value of this measure is one and again we came with a simple heuristic it's called dice disconnect internally connect externally so when a group wants to hide we ask each of the members to find one new friend from outside this community uh, completely at random and befriend a new person from outside the group. Uh, we, in some cases, we might also want to disconnect some edges inside the community. However, according to our simulations, it's not really necessary. So let's see some results. For three different networks, we will see the measures of concealment in a process where we ask each person to, to find one new friend from outside the group. So the, the, on the x-axis, we have completion of the process. So at the right-hand side of the axis, we'll have a moment in which every single person find, found one new friend. On the y-axis, we have our measure of concealment. Let's see how it was. Every color is a different, this different way of hiding. So we can see that our, our hiding heuristic is successful, right? According to all, all, all community detection algorithms, in all three of these networks, we are able to hide successfully the community. We selected communities which are exposed at the beginning. So that's why at the beginning, the, the value of the concealment is always zero. And by finding new friends, we are able to hide from, from these community detection algorithms. Uh, OK. So these were community detection algorithms. Now we move to link prediction algorithms. Link prediction algorithms are methods of evaluating a likelihood that there exists an edge in the network. In particular, we'll focus on similarity indices, which is a particular type of link prediction algorithms, which for any pair of nodes that are not connected in network, assigns a probability. And this probability can be interpreted two different ways. First of all, it can be interpreted that, okay, maybe there is a connection between them, but we just don't see it, right? right? Maybe we just did not disclose this particular connection to the, to the outside world. And another, another way of interpreting this is that OK, maybe there is no connection there, but maybe there will be connection there in the future. Maybe it will be this a future match. So we consider nine different local similarity indices. And, but however, all of them work based on a very similar basis. In all of them, you have this expression NVW, which is the set of common neighbors. So the idea behind all of these different similarity indices in the literature is very similar. Uh, so the more common friends we have, the greater the probability that we actually know each other. Or in a different interpretation, the more common friends we have, the greater the probability that we will also become friends in the future. So this is the idea behind, behind these local similar things. Um, so again, how do we measure the quality of link prediction? Because it might be unclear. Uh, there are many different methods of uh, measures of quality in the literature. In this, in this work, we focus on two, on AUC and AP. AUC is area under log curve. And it has a very nice, very nice interpretation. We take a look at the ranking of all the edges, of, of all the non-edges given to the, the algorithms. And an algorithm will produce a ranking, right? And some of these non-edges are actual non-edges. So edges that do not exist. The others are hidden edges. So edges that exist in the network, but remain undisclosed to the outside world. And how do we evaluate this ranking? Well, AUC, in the AUC, 
the quality of a ranking is a probability that a randomly chosen hidden edge will get assigned a greater value than a randomly chosen non-edge. So for example, in this particular ranking, first, we randomly select one of the two non-edges. These, these are those one halves. And when we take a look at this non-edge, the probability that this ranking will assign a greater score to a uh, will assign a greater score to to this non-edge than to randomly chosen. Uh, sorry, the probability that the the algorithm will assign greater score to this hidden edge than to randomly chosen non-edge is five over six, right? Because there are five non-edges that are below it in the ranking and only one that is above, so that's why five six. And when we take a look at this hidden edge. The probability that the, the that when you randomly pick a non-edge, it that it will have smaller 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 position in this ranking is one half, right? Because three three of the of the non-edges are below it in the ranking. So the the AUC for this particular ranking is zero is two thirds zero point sixty six. So for example, we could also see that if both hidden edges, if both blue edges, would be on the very top of the ranking, then this AUC will be one, right? Which is kind of reasonable because this is the very best, the very best outcome from the perspective of the prediction, right? If both non-edge, if both hidden edges are on the top of the ranking, then I'm very happy. Uh, the other measure, the average precision, takes the average precision of a family of classifier. Uh, so in, in practice, what I do is I take a look at the position of, of this hidden edge in the rankings. I take a look at all the edges that are above him. And I calculate the, the, the precision of this group. So out of this group, only one of them should actually be there. That's why the precision is 1 over 2. And if I take a look at this edge, if I take a look at all the edges above him, above it, out of those five edges, only two should be there, right? This hidden edge and this hidden edge. That's why the precision of this for this edge is 2 over 5. So the average precision of this classifier is 0 0.45. Again, these are two very different measures of quantifying how good the result of a link prediction is. And it's very simple to like construct an artificial example in which, in which they will give very different, very different results. However, when you work on this topic, these were like two most popular. So that's why we use them. Uh, Again, why link prediction could be a problem. Uh, first of all, we just might want to keep some of our relationships private, right? Maybe we don't want to disclose each and every one of our, our connections with other people to the outside world. However, it might be even worse, worse possibility. It might happen that link prediction will erroneously come to some conclusion. So the link prediction might think that we are connected to someone that we do not want to be associated with, even though we are actually not predicting, we are not connected to them. So it might taint our reputations. That's why we want to hide some of the even non-existing relationships from link prediction. So again, we have this time some edges that we want to hide in the network, in which at the beginning, they are very exposed. They are being assigned very high scores by some link prediction algorithms. So again, we want to add and remove some edges so that in this new resulting network, these edges are much better hidden. As in the most, most settings so far, uh, all of these problems, all these hiding problems are incomplete. So it's very hard, very hard to find the optimal way of hiding from these particular in prediction algorithms. However, again, we, come, we came up with some heuristics. This time we have two heuristics, one based on removing edges, one based on adding edges. In the first one, we remove edges that are parts of many closed triads. In, in network science, a triad is just a triangle in the network. By closed triads, we mean triads which have two edges, so two black edges, two edges that are visible to the seeker, and one edge that we want to hide. And if you take a look at what actually happens here, is by removing this one network, all of these three pairs of hidden edges, all of the three pairs of nodes, suddenly lose a common neighbor. So by removing this one edge, we remove one common neighbor from, from all of these three hidden edges. That's why it's getting more hidden. 
That's why we are getting more here. And in another heuristic, we try to create open triads. So by adding one edge, we create new, new common neighbors for edges that are actually non-existing. So instead of actively lowering our discourse of hidden edges, we are increasing the scores of an act of actual non-edges in this network. Um, okay, so what we do in this work, we also we also um, evaluate the effects of size and density. So, generally, is it easier to hide in small networks or in large networks? Is it easier to hide in sparse networks, so networks with few edges, or in dense networks, networks with, with many edges? What we do, we randomly generate networks with varying size and density, and we compare the relative value of AUC and AP after hiding. So by relative value, I mean that uh, at the value of one, nothing changes. The lower this value, the better hidden uh, my edges are. So in the top row, we'll see results for uh, large versus small networks. So we have size at the, at the x-axis. On the left, we have small networks. On the right of each plot, we have we have large networks. Uh, in the bottom row, we have density. So on the left, we have uh, sparse networks, networks with few edges. On the right, we have dense networks, that was the networks with many edges. And again, the lower, the better hidden we are. So we can see that no matter whether it's the addition heuristics of the OTC or the removal heuristics, so the CTR, it is easier to hide in small and dense networks, which from the perspective of a potential invader is a bit unfortunate because in, in our today's life, most of the networks that we are part of are usually large and sparse. So it's a bit unfortunate. However, it's the simulation show that it's easier to hide in small and dense networks. Next, we evaluate random versus strategic changes. So, okay, so we devised some of these heuristics, but maybe it's enough to just do some random changes to the networks, right? Maybe just to add and remove some edges uh, in any way we can, and maybe we'll get some good results. Uh, so again, we compare our heuristics, our addition, uh, addition heuristic and our removal heuristic with random changes. So with adding or removing random edges from this network. Uh, now on the x-axis, we have different different link prediction algorithms. On the y-axis, we have uh, the relative change in, in AUC. So the lower the value, the better hidden we are. In purple, we have random changes. In green, we have strategic changes. So for addition, we have relatively little difference. For removal, the difference is about up to 20%, which is much more reasonable. And for AP, we see very similar trends. What might be considered slightly important here is that if we do random changes, so for purple bars, we, some, we sometimes move above one. So not only we do not hide our hidden edges, we are making them more exposed by making the random changes in network as opposed to strategic changes. Okay, so so far we've seen results for random networks. Now we, we run our heuristics for a real life network. So for telecommunication network from one of uh, European ma major cellular providers, which consists of about a quarter million nodes and a little, a little less than one million edges. And again, we can see that even in, in real life network, even in non-random network, our heuristics still remain relatively, relatively successful. Uh, OTC, not so much. So adding edges is maybe not very helpful in most cases. However, CTR, so removing the edges, is usually allowing us to hide our edges from link prediction algorithms. OK, part four, source detection algorithms. Um, so here, we'll consider some type of process spreading through the network. I'm sure that after COVID, most of us heard about different types of things spreading through the network, about different types of theoretical models of spreading stuff in the network. So this is a very simple model. Again, at the beginning, every single, every single node, the source is active. 
and then the process, the process spreads according to some rules. In this presentation, I will focus on a very simple model, on susceptible infected model, in which in every single round, out of the, the constant number of T rounds, each infected nodes try each infected nodes try to infect each of their neighbors with, with constant probability. So in a way, it is a bit similar to the independent cascade model that I presented like an hour ago. Uh, however, here in the independent cascade model, it ended when we ran out of new infections. This, this model just goes over the set amount of time, over T rounds. OK, so what is source detection? Source detection is the task of inferring based on the state of the of the end state of the process, which of the node was the source of this process. So I assume that the information available to me is only the structure of the network and the end state of each node. That means whether the node is infected at the moment or not. So I come at the very end of the process, I look at what happened, and I ask myself a question. Who was the source? Which part? Which part of the? In which node of this network the the diffusion started? The process began itself. Uh, and we focus on methods that actually allow us to rank all the nodes. So I do not only get an information of who is the source. I will get the ranking of the of the of all the possible sources in this network. And I consider a few different source detection algorithms. First in the run is the run the walk. So. The best possible solution would just to compute maximum likelihood estimator, right? To for each for each for each particular node, for each particular possible source, to say, hmm, what is the probability that if I start at this node, I will arrive at this end state of the process, right? However, it's very difficult to, to calculate in most cases, particularly for larger networks. So we try to approximate it in different ways. For example, we can approximate the diffusion with random walks. This is the random walk, one random walk algorithm. Or we could try to run Monte Carlo process, right? We could try to start many different diffusions across the network. For each of the nodes, I start I start a diffusion many times, and I see how similar is, are the outcomes of these artificial diffusions to the actual state that I found in the network. And there is a group of methods based on centrality measures that we, we have seen at the beginning of this presentation. For these methods, I take a look at only the infected part of the network, and I say, hmm, OK, so maybe the most important node in this infected part of the network is the actual source. Um, OK, so again, we might consider a situation in which the source might not want to be identified. right? For example, this process that spread through the network might be a vicious rumor, or a fake news, or a computer virus. right? In such a case, the source, so the evader, might not want to be identified as the as the source of this process, as the one who started spreading this rumor, for example. And in this work, we consider two different ways of hiding. This is an example of a network in which the red nodes are the infected nodes, and the node with the face is, is the evader, is the source. And despite it, it's green, the, uh, the evader is very unhappy because in the ranking of the closeness, the evader now occupies the first place. So if someone will analyze this network using closeness uh, source detection algorithm, the evader will be exposed as the source. So what can the evader do? We consider two different ways. First, we might consider adding some nodes to the network, right? So in this case, in this example, the evader adds two new nodes represented as bots in this network, and in this newly newly changed network, the evader is now not first, but third. Or the evader might try to add or remove some edges from the network. And by removing it, its connections after the, the, after the diffusion process stopped, the evader might remove their connections, hide their connections with D and H. And now the evader is not first, but fifth in the ranking. In particular, again, we assume that the evader has some limited budgets of, budget for the changes and that the evader wants some number of nodes to be above above themselves in the in the in the ranking again as usual most of these problems are incomplete so it's hard to find the optimal solution however we tried some different heuristics uh, first heuristic that add heuristic that add the nodes we might connect all the nodes 
to the same high degree node in the network. We might connect different bots to different high degree nodes in the network, or we might, cons we might connect them completely on random. And we also consider two different variants with those three heuristics. So either we connect the bots only to existing nodes, or we connect the bots, we connect the bots network as a as a cohesive group, as a as a closely connected group. Similarly, when it, when we try to modify the edges, we can add edges to high degree nodes, to low degree nodes, to random nodes. Or we can disconnect the divider from high degree nodes, from low degree nodes, or from random nodes. The next slide will contain the most horrifying figure in this presentation, but I will try to guide you through it. OK, so first of all, uh, OK, maybe we don't even need to change anything, right? Maybe from the very beginning, as a source, I am already hidden. Uh, in each of these heat maps, on the x-axis, you will have size of the network, so the number of nodes in the network. On the y-axis, you will have average degree of the network. And the warmer the color, the better hidden the evader is. So here we can see that in Barabasi Albert networks, so in networks with scale-free structures, I am very hidden without doing anything. This is the state of the network without doing any strategic hiding. Right? So particularly if I'm part of large and dense network, I'm very well hidden. However, if we move to struct to Erdosreni or to what strogat structures, which are structures with uh, more flat degree distributions, what strogat is a small world structure, the evader is much more exposed without any strategic hiding, right? These, these colors are much closer to zero. Um, so let's see some results of strategic hiding. First, of hiding by adding nodes. OK, so each of these hexes, the color of the hex corresponds to the best heuristic that we consider, the, the effectiveness of the best heuristic. And the larger the highlighted triangle, the more effective the heuristic. So for example, in this particular, for this particular hex, the most effective heuristic, so the heuristic with the larger triangle, is the degree click heuristic. So the heuristic in which we take a group of nodes, we connect them into a click, and we connect each of them to high degree, to different high degree nodes. So let's see the results. Again, they are very, very, very similar between each other, right? So in most cases, the most effective way of hiding by adding nodes is to connect the bots into a click and to connect this new dense group of nodes into the network. And how it looks for modifying edges. We can see that in most cases, the most effective heuristics are the heuristics from the bottom half of, of each hex, right? So those are the heuristics that correspond to deleting edges, to removing edges from the network. Moreover, in some of the in some of the upper halves of the hexes, we have minuses. Minus signifies that not only as an invader, I, become, I did not only become more hidden, I became more exposed. So in most cases, by adding edges to the network, I'm becoming more exposed. So again, we can see the, sa the same trend kind of holds over, over multiple different settings, right? By removing edges, I can hide easily. By adding edges to the network, I become more exposed. Um, here we can see how effective, how many these, these plots show us, how many nodes have to be added to the network in order to achieve the same the same result as removing a single edge. So you can see that in most cases, particularly Barbasial network, networks, I have to add tens of nodes to the network to get the same result as, as removing just a single edge. So in a sense, if I can allow myself to remove some of my connections from the network, it usually is much more effective than adding nodes to them. Um, here we will see the impact of extending diffusion time. So how much time I will allow the process to spread through the network before I come and analyze it using source detection. On the x-axis, we have diffusion time. On the y-axis, we have evader ranking. So the lower the value, the better hidden the evader is. And you can see that pretty much all over, we could expect that if I allow the diffusion to spread over longer time, it is much more easier to hide for the source, right? 
if I if there are more nodes who are who are infected, it's much 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 easy, it's it's easier to hide in between them. Uh, we also analyze the effects of seeker with imperfect knowledge. So what if I, as a seeker, know only about certain percentage of edges from the network, except from the random? And clearly, again, the greater my knowledge, the the easier it is for me to find the fader, right? Which is also kind of expected. And finally, uh, so far, we have seen results for random networks. And we also have some results for, for an interesting data set, I think. This is the data set we got from Suna Lehmann's group in Copenhagen. So what they did is they spread eight new hashtags on Twitter. So not only are the networks, not only are the networks realistic here, also the diffusion itself is realistic. So this is this kind of recreates how these new eight new hashtags spread in Twitter. And we we evaluated the effectiveness of the best of our heuristics here. And we can see that again, even in this realistic network, very realistic network, because also the diffusion process is, is based on real data, the hiding process is, is successful. Okay, and finally, the last part of the presentation, part about state detection. This is not very connected to networks. It is more about machine learning. So maybe a different subset of people will find it interesting. Okay, so stance detection is a task of inferring an opinion, either positive or negative, about a specific topic. So we take a look at the, at the set of of uh, content posted on social media, in our case, on the set of tweets. And based on it, we infer whether an opinion of a person who posted these tweets either is either positive or negative. And it's important to mention here that it's not that these tweets express some opinion directly. It's not that I say I hate a certain politician. It's, it's saying that the, the machine learning algorithms can catch up to some subtle clues that are imperceivable to the human's eye. So might, might infer the opinion about certain topics, even from tweets about other topics. So again, the problem in stance detection is that we might not want to let some of our private opinion be, be we might not want some of our private opinion to be, to be known to the entire world, right? So I might have some kind of private opinion, some kind of secret, but I still want to post my, my content on, on social media, right? So I still want to post to Twitter. However, a seeker might, came, might take my public Twitter feed and use trust detection algorithm to infer, infer my, my private information, the information that you want to maintain private. So in this work, we use two different data sets. First of all, we train stance detection algorithms using data sets of tweets with, that, were, that were labeled with opinions about atheism, feminism, and Hillary Clinton, either positive opinions or negative opinions. We also run a survey study via Amazon Mechanical Turk with over 1,000 participants with questions based on this, on this stance detection algorithms that we trained. And what are our results? First, we, ask, we asked every single participant to stand their opinion about each topic as strongly against, against, neither in favor, strongly in favor. So again, these topics were atheism, feminism, and Hillary Clinton. Uh, then we asked each participant to what degree they feel the need to avoid revealing this stance. So do they want to hide the stance or not? And here in the plots, we will see for three different topics, the percentage of people who, who reported this need to hide their stance as eight or above. So these are people who really feel strong need to hide their stance about, hide their opinion about these topics. So these are participants who, who stated their stance as strongly against. So we can see that 10% of them want to hide their opinion about atheism, 20% of them want to hide their opinion about Hillary Clinton, 23% of them want to hide their opinion about feminism. So these are those who are strongly against these topics. And what happens if we take a look at all the other people? One interesting thing is that when we take a look who really strongly want to hide their opinion, these are not the partisans. These are not those who hold very strong opinion. 
but these are more normal people, more norm, more average people, right? These are those with more moderate opinions. We can see that actually those who want the, to hide their stance, their opinion the most, are those who hold against or neither opinion, so kind of closer to, to neutral. So, okay, can people hide their opinions from these machine learning algorithms without any help? Because maybe they don't need any additional algorithmic help, right? So for each of them, we showed them, we selected, we selected words or Twitter accounts that are very strong, that algorithm, that machine learning algorithm, believes to be very strongly correlated with, with, with an opinion. To be to so those are the algorithms that are very strongly associated with either the against stance or the in favor stance. And we asked the people to say, what do they think? Do you think these words, these Twitter accounts, indicate strong opinion about atheism or feminism or Hillary Clinton, or maybe they are not important at all? Again, these are these were all very strongly, these are the strongest correlating words. So this is the distribution of the, the answers. In the left call, each each row is a different is a different word or Twitter account that we asked our the people about. In the left column, we have accounts and words that were associated with negative opinions. So this is the the correct answer is strongly against. In the right column are results for answers associated with the strongly in favor opinion. So the correct answer is strongly in favor. So these are very, very positive words. And in each in each bar is a distribution of the answers of, of our participants, right? So you can see that in many cases, we were unable to, to correctly identify. If, if we would have perfect knowledge, this and the left, the entire left column should be dark red, the entire right column should be dark green. However, as you can see, this is not the case. If we take a look at aggregated results, and if we take a look that at the uh, features that were associated negatively per topic, only about a third of the participants recognized the features that were negatively associated with feminism. Again, the association is done by the algorithm, not by, by people. Uh, only about one fifth of the participants correctly recognized features that were negatively associated with Hillary Clinton, and only about half of the participants negatively recognized features which were negatively associated with atheism. And if we take a look at the features with positive associations, the results are slightly more, slightly better. However, still they are typically between 30 and 50%. So most people are unable to correctly recognize whether a given word or a given Twitter account uh, is meaningful to an algorithm or what stance it's, it's connected to for the algorithm. What, what, what type of stance will machine learning algorithm infer from using this word or from following this account? Okay. Cool. So if people are unable to do it on their own, maybe we could help them. Maybe we could design some algorithms. So again, we consider different types of hiding algorithms. Those that remove features and those that remove features uh, that are indicative of my actual stance, or those that add features which are indicative of my opposite stance. Uh, and we and we divide them into two different two different categories based on the accounts they follow or based the account that are mentioned in our tweets. And the the on the x-axis we'll have the number of features that we either add or remove. <laughs> on the y-axis we have the F1 score of the algorithm. So in a way the lower the value, the better hidden my opinion is. So so far in all the cases that we have seen, what it was that in the network settings, removing edges was very par powerful. Removing edges allowed me to, to hide very easily. Addition was not, was not successful at, for, at all. Will it be also a matter here? As it turns out, no. So if I think about features, if I think about the account I follow, the accounts I follow, I follow on Twitter, or the accounts I mentioned on Twitter, it is much better if I want to hide to add some accounts which are indicative of my opposite, of the opposite stance to mine rather than to remove some of the accounts that I actually, actually follow. We can see that addition is much more successful. The red line, the red line marks the, the F1 score of a modifier, of a classifier, which is just a, a weighted coin toss. So in a way, if I am below the red line, uh, the algorithm cannot do better than a random guess if he looks at, at, my, at my Twitter data. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, 
rapid development in AI and social enterprises tools raise many privacy concerns, right? In many cases, these type of algorithms can be used to expose some of the sensitive information, some of the information that I would prefer to keep private, but they might be exposed to the, to the general public. Even if I never posted this information online, some of my private data can be exposed just by using some kind of new generation algorithms. In most cases, in most settings, finding the optimal way of hiding from this from these algorithms is NP complete problem. So it cannot so reasonably it cannot be done. It cannot be it cannot, the optimal way of hiding cannot be found easily. However, in basically each of these cases, we are able to find some kind of heuristic algorithms which help us to hide, which are not optimal, but are reasonably effective in general case. So we hope that this line of research will kind of take the first steps toward empowering the, the people, the members of the social network to proactively protect their privacy instead of putting all of their hopes in the centralized authority. So I would like to thank all the co-authors in this line of research, in particular, Tal Rahman, who was part of all the papers I presented today and who is right now my boss at NYU Abu Dhabi, <coughs> and to Tomek Michalak, who was my PhD supervisor and who was part of almost all of the works in, that I presented today. So thank you, much for, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to ask any questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Martin Awane, uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, this is very lucid and very informative also. And I'm sure that uh, you will get some questions from the audience. So audience is very good. In all the algorithms, there were maybe uh, prominently there were addition of nodes or edges or uh, these kind of approaches. So practically there is, uh, I mean, if there is a person who is vigilant on the behavior of a node, behavior is not private. I mean, if I assume that the changes that are made are not static and they are happening over the time, maybe in an IoT network or something, and the behavior is not private. So how do you guard the behavior of private? Sure, sure, sure. So this is definitely, yes, in basically all of these cases, we assumed that the, the seeker comes and kind of analyzes the network in a static way, right? So it doesn't, so the seeker does not have access to the, the history of changes over the entire network. And this is a very good point. Uh, we, we, at some point, we considered using some algorithms. I don't remember the, na the name of this class of algorithms right now, but to detect, to kind of detect suspicious operations in the network, right? to take a look at the, at the natural evolution of a social network, then try to add some, then try to add some of our strategic changes, some of our strategic hiding changes, and to see whether these algorithms will be able to, to detect whether, to distinguish between the, these natural evolution changes and these strategic changes. Uh, we did not have very conclusive results, unfortunately. So, so we tried this, we did not came with any anything that could be published. So the answer is kind of, I, I don't know. At the moment, unfortunately. Okay, so is there any other questions? Excuse me, sir. So, in one of the slides, you told uh, that uh, when there are persons that are, that are communicating, one is the Facebook group and one is the email group. What if we want to merge, means uh, I want to share some data from Facebook to uh, email, and will it be still and complete? Uh... I don't have I don't have like direct results in in front of me. I I think it's the root. Like according to our our simulations, it will be very hard to find in to hide in this way. Then it is so, uh, hard. Uh, by very hard, I mean that that using using our heuristics, it was unsuccessful. It was unsuccessful to hide to find the optimal solution. So in terms of RB hardness, I I would guess so. Like th this would my intuition would be that it would, it would still remain NP hard. But I don't remember exactly the the, the like direct formulation of the program in the moment. So, will, will I, I'll be able to prove that or no? Mm -hmm. You might be. I, I, I don't think we proved it. I think it could be proven. I can share my data out of the Facebook. When I want to share some of the pictures supposed to, mm -hmm. and I want to email to you, then I'll be able to do that. So in a sense, like NP NP hardness and NP completeness is is not for a particular case, right? Is is for is for is for the general 
they're an abstract problem, right? Yeah. So in so we haven't we haven't tested this. So we considered we considered so in a sense you you suggest to in a way in a way connect with a person in more than one layer, right? Yeah. It's a good question. We I don't think we test. I think what we tried is connecting with every person in only a single layer. So I, I don't know. It it yeah. Yeah. So it, it might it, like my intuition it, it would probably be and people did because as you have seen throughout the presentations, most of these problems are at Picopit, right? Once like a network is a very is a very rich structure, right? It's very it's very easy to kind of present a very complicated problem using a relatively simple network structure. So most of these problems are in Picopit. I would guess this would be also, but we haven't proved it. So. Is there any near common heuristic that can work for all because there are four parts that you have presented rather than having a heuristic which is different to, you know, to solve all four problems? Sure. It's like a near common one which can you know reasonably do in all cases. So again, we haven't tried that. Like in a very general sense, the answer is that for network problems, removal is very powerful. In all of the four network problems, the removal of edges, the, the removal of of connections of your own con existing connections on the network, was was very successful in, in hiding your position in the network, which is maybe not very surprising because, in a sense, all of you get from the network you get through the edges, right? So the removal of these edges is it might depending on the type of network might be a very great sacrifice, right? So you might not want to remove these edges. However, all of all of this research shows that this is that if you would want to have an ultimate heuristic is to slowly disconnect from the network, which again, maybe is intuitive. So in one of the problems, you are adding the additional nodes. Yes. Lead, uh, I think leader and that uh, captains. What if captains, you know, captains privacy is also compromised in the case, right? Yes, but in, maybe in no. order to protect that leader's claim, captains are, you know, are being connected. Yes. With many edges. And their degree of centrality may increase. Sure, sure, sure. So if you think about this, in a sense, centrality is a zero. Like this, this type of settings are zero sum games, right? Because since the centrality will produce some kind of ranking, someone will be at the top of this ranking, right? Someone, in a sense, someone will have to take the blame because this is the, the nature of this, these methods, right? We just produce a ranking and like, yeah, someone will be the first on its ranking. So so yeah, so in a sense, we call them captains because we want them to feel good about themselves, but in a way they are scapegoats, right? They, they are the one who will take the blame. They are the one who will take the strike from the leaders because they are the one with high centrality and they were des specifically designed in order to have high centrality in network structure. Why can't we just have this uh, ranking to keep all these people in one rank, almost near rank, so that the random picking may hide it, right? Yes, it, it, it is an option, but in a sense, it's very hard to maintain because this would need to be a very, a very symmetric network structure, right? Which, in practice, if you if you saw the the nine eleven, for example, network in this presentation, like it's not very symmetric at all, right? Because all of these all of these connections, like some of them, some of them represented communications via telephone. Some of them represented the fact that these two people were family members. Some of them represented that some of them trained in the same camp somewhere in the desert, right? So it's very hard to maintain a very, very particular network such for a long time. Like I did not present these results, but for example, you have results that in the, in the captain structure that I showed today, all of these normal members of the network were completely disconnected, right? In the in the in the article, we show that if you can you can basically connect them into any reasonable network, and the structure will stay will still will still work, right? If you have this this overhead of captains over them, so yeah, this would be a solution to to maintain like very very symmetric network, very well ordered network, but in reality, it would be probably very hard because some of some of these connections are. In a way, impossible. For us, blood ties are very hard to like control specifically, right? The, fa the family ties. So, yeah. But but it is a possible solution. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so question: Just hiding what I understand from the uh, the 
uh, is it like uh, deceiving uh, link prediction algorithms or just pulling those? Is it just uh, same thing? Yes. So or is, or is the over should be like this? Uh, in a sense, it is. Yeah. So I, we assume that the, the seeker like perceives this network through the through the lens of, of an algorithm, right? So if we if we deceive link prediction algorithm, we in a sense deceive the seeker. Although, like interesting aspect from the point of view of the of the evader. So it's from the point of view of the member of the network. If I'm part of the network, I might not know what type of algorithms will be used to analyze my network, right? So in a sense, I I would be often in a need. Of, of a hiding method that is very universal, right? That will work against many different link prediction algorithms and not just a particular link prediction algorithm. So this is also an aspect that, that might be taken into consideration, right? Whether the, my hiding methods are universal or they're just like very targeted against a particular other technique. Because usually it's probably easier to find a solution to a very particular technique rather than a heuristic that will work uh, like across many different, many different situations. I guess the hiding is easier in a topology-based uh, link prediction or the social theory-based link prediction algorithm? Uh, sorry, I, I don't think I got it. Hiding would be easier in, in which situation? There are uh, this link prediction algorithm, there are categories, you know, this uh, topology-based uh, algorithms and social theory-based algorithms. I'm not sure. Like, th these were done, like, when I speak about hardness, in a sense of NP hardness or finding the optimal solution, we only tested these these seven or nine, this, these nine that I presented. But in a sense, they were very, they already were very simple, right? In a sense, we were just looking at, at the topology of the network, and they were looking at your common neighbors and kind of weighing them against your 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 degree and degrees of your neighbors. So even for those very simple methods. Finding the optimal solution was already NP complete. So again, I would assume that most in most cases the, the optimal solution in the general case will be will be NP complete, no matter what methods we use, because of how simple these methods were. Uh, it might alter the original IoT network and its original use case. Mm -hmm. So, was there a study like how does it come up with the overhead on the original activity of the network? Original activity of the network. The overhead side of the <coughs> story of security. So, uh, yeah. So this this is of course true. That as I said, like many of these heuristic kind of the way in which we try to model this is that we try to say. Okay, you are only allowed to add these edges and you are only, only allowed to remove some edges, right? Because definitely some of my edges, I might not be able to remove. For example, connections to my family, I will never hide that I know them, yes, of course. Some of the edges I might not want to remove because they are very, 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 very important. Very, very important for my for my activities, right? So this, this was the way in which we tried to kind of maintain the normal activities in the network. By allowing you, allowing you to say, okay, I, I'm willing to to sacrifice these connections. I'm willing to add some some these connections, because adding the connections is also investing some kind of resources, right? I, it might might cost me to maintain a relationship with a certain person, right? In order to seem like I have a connection with someone, I might want to message them from time to time, talk to them, time to time, meet with them from time to time, right? And I might just not like a certain person, not want to meet with them. So it's, this is also some kind of allocation of some kind of resources, right? So th this is the way in which we try to try to model the, the, the effort to kind of remain the normal, normal, normal activities of these networks. And another way was this adding this countermeasure, right? That I want to remain hidden, but I want, also want to remain influential in this network. So in many of these cases, if we would just to allow any changes, it has a very simple solution, right? I just disconnect myself completely from the network and I'm completely free, right? No one will find me, because, but I also will get nothing from this network. I'm probably not a part of this network just out of my out of whim. I just I also get something from this network. So I still want to maintain getting this something from this particular network. So these are these are the ways in which I try to model this 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 problem, this trade-off. 
Okay. Uh, so I think there is no more questions. Uh, I have one or two more questions, uh, simple questions. So uh, one thing I was uh, thinking that uh, we are sharing our opinions in the social media. So why do uh, we want to hide it? Like <laughs> we, are, we are sharing because we know that this is a social media and people would uh, see it, they would uh, give some reply and they would uh, maybe use it for different purposes. So still, uh, what is the purpose of uh, hiding this thing? Sure, sure, sure. So it might happen that uh, I assume maybe maybe just maybe I I will, but like maybe most of us have some opinions that they might not want to share, right? Of course, I post on social media all different things. So the problem is that it for the algorithm for a for a person, it's true that they might read your 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 feed. And they might say, oh, okay, not, nothing weird here. The problem is that algorithms might infer your opinions not about the topics that you posted about, right? So even if you post about something very innocent, they might want to infer your opinion about, about something completely different. This is this is one danger. Another danger <laughs> that I think is even that is probably like mm, applies to everyone. The algorithms might came based on what you post about completely innocent post topics, might came to the wrong conclusions about your opinions on some very important topics, right? So, you, so algorithms, because of some weird, weird uh, inner workings of these algorithms, might came to the wrong conclusion about your opinion about very, very important topic, right? So it might be useful to have a tool, like we suggest this type of tool we haven't come up with yet, that for example, if you post something on social media, you might get an alert that, okay, for an algorithm, this, this would suggest that you are follower of something, of some group that you might maybe do not want to be associated with, right? So this is on those always a, a danger that you will be associated with someone that you do not want to be, that you are not associated with, and you do not want to be falsely associated with. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so let's thank uh, Dr. Uh, Wani for his uh, nice lecture. Thank you. Thank <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Masin, for your highly motivational talk on social networks. Now, I would like to invite Professor Ram Sarkar to present a gift of token to Dr. Masin. Okay. So, you can come back. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, would like to invite Dr. Swata Pal to present a gift or token to Professor Ram Sarkar. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So the lunch will start at 1.30 p.m. outside the seminar hall. I would like to thank everyone for listening to the lectures. Thank you all.